which gets to the heart of rewilding in that it was addressing fear. And I think that was my life was learning how to be thrown in very scary situations, very unfamiliar, all that kind of stuff, and yet still being able to find myself. And and so that's what rewilding is to me. You know, it's like I'm having a conversation with the world now. <laughs> it's not just who I feel safe with. It's uh, opening myself up to not only internally who I am, but externally with other people, but also with the rest of the world, <laughs> which is a lot bigger than people, let me tell you. Hello and welcome. As always, I'm Abby. This is Stories Lived, Stories Told. And today, I invite you to join me in conversation with Mark Edwards as we take a communication perspective on rewilding. To take a communication perspective is to consider what we're making and how we're making it through our communication practices. This means that we look closely at patterns, context, stories, and relationships, and that we use curiosity, mindfulness, collaboration, and dialogue to create better social worlds. Whether the topic of today's conversation is familiar to you or not, the hope is that using a communication perspective will reveal new ways of seeing and being. At the top of the episode, you heard our conversation partner today, Mark Edwards. Mark is a naturalist on a mission to rewild. He is a leader with Be Wild Rewild and its Big River Connectivity Project. He also worked for the Iowa Department of Natural Resources for 30 years, where he led restoration efforts across the state. Today's conversation with Mark is kicking off our next series. I'm calling this the sustainability series. And when I say that, I want you to think about what sustainability really means. On one level, I imagine we all recognize the connection the word has to conservation efforts, conversations about being environmentally friendly and addressing issues like climate change. But when we break it down, the word literally means the ability to sustain sustainability, to carry on, to continue in a certain manner. And the question of sustainability is a really important one. It matters that we ask ourselves, are our practices, are our ways of being sustainable as it relates to ourselves and our own well-being, but also to the earth and to non-human beings as well. In this conversation, Mark is going to teach us about rewilding specifically which is the process of restoring usually land back to its natural, uncultivated state. But as we're going to hear today, it means a lot more than that to Mark. And truthfully, he's still figuring it out. So let's start the conversation with Mark. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation today. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm just so excited, Abby, to have the opportunity to have a conversation about this topic because I think it's so important. Yes, I think it's important too. And I do not know about it as much as you do. So I'm excited to learn from you today and, you know, hope that I can contribute some to this conversation too uh, with my perspective. And I think we'll create something really cool. To start, can you share a little bit about yourself? Help us to get to know you. Tell us your story a little bit. Yeah. Well, let's see. Like I say, I'm 76 years old. It's a long story. Uh, (laughs) So I'm trying to present it in a way that will facilitate the discussion about this, Mm -hmm. what rewilding means. And I think, you know, at first I need to clarify that, that I'm still don't know what it means. I'm still exploring that. And I do that the exploration with other people and with other beings out there. So that's my history. And my story is going to explain that to some degree, I hope. Mm-hmm. So uh, it starts out, I guess I did a presentation for Audubon here not too long ago, and you know they're bird-oriented. So I was thinking in terms of bird, and then I went back to, I, I remember my parents were uh, like factory workers in Indianapolis. And so on the weekends, they would escape and we would drive out into the countryside. And I was the firstborn, you know, and so they would get me out there and we'd go look at cows and stuff. But my mother would always tell me, you know, oh, your first word was bird because I'd see these things moving by, you know. And so I have a thing with birds uh, that I listen to. And so um, from that, then on that level of our human level they um my dad joined into the military and went off to war and that meant we moved immediately from that area we moved over to california 
And then I think after about a year and a half, we moved to New Mexico. And then after that, a few years, we moved to Texas. And so we were constantly moved uh, mm -hmm. every year to the longest place I've ever been was three years uh, before I got here. And so that exposure to these various cultures, because when we were in Texas, we were at the very southern tip of Texas. So we had a lot of exposure to uh, that culture and to those languages and stuff, which of course, I didn't really understand on some levels, but I ended up playing with kids. And so we had to learn to communicate, even though we didn't understand the languages so much. And so that kind of continued on. And then, you know, going to various steps there anyway, but there was, an, I could do all bird stories everywhere we learned because uh, yeah. that's where I kept connecting through birds. But uh, we moved to Florida. My father went to college to uh, in Tallahassee to further his education. And in that point, that's when I started getting a little bit more freedom to run uh, out there. And so I'd climb trees and then I'd have these bird experiences in the trees and stuff with the birds. And so then we go on and we moved to Florida. Then my grandparents moved there. So we had a long term connection to there because every time we'd move, we'd come back to go visit the grandparents. And so that was Florida. And so that was kind of a base in a way for me. And then uh, we moved to Japan, and that was in my junior high years. And so that was a large military school, hundreds of people, and kind of a lot different than what I was used to because mm -hmm. smaller schools locally and stuff. And so uh, this, we ended up there uh, going out, living out in what they call the rice paddies. And so we lived off base. And, you know, I ended up playing a lot with uh, Japanese uh, people, which couldn't understand in a way and everything. But we learned to share things. Yeah, <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, you just do that. And and so I, I felt really fortunate that way. And there was all kind of different bird stuff going on there. And so um, that was a really uh, I really appreciated my parents no matter what. They were really good about getting us outdoors and going places and and. Mm -hmm. and not afraid to jump out into the world. And at that time, um, give you one example, I, I used to have to ride the train. I'd ride the train into downtown Tokyo and I'd go to the dentist and uh, I'd do that by myself. And I'd be walking through crowds of hundreds of Japanese people, anti-American screaming, yelling, mm -hmm. anti-American stuff. And I never once felt threatened ever there. I mean, it was just a whole different society of way of relating and politeness and taking care of. It was just really affected my life. Mm -hmm. And so then uh, at that time, um, I was kind of getting in trouble in that I was not happy with being moving all the time. You know, you couldn't keep any friends. Uh, yeah. You move, you end up with friends that you know, a little scary, you know, because they're they're a little disconnected from everything too, and so you ended up getting in trouble and doing things I regret and and things like that. And so that was a big change in my life. And right when things were really coming to a head of you know I hate everything, I hate my parents, all right, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then we moved, and we moved to Sergeant Bluff in Iowa, which is on the Missouri Rivers. Graduating class was thirty two people, so and most of them were farming small town business people not used to military brats as we were called oh uh, yeah so, you know and you try to integrate in and, and everything but it was it was extremely hard and so that was a chance for me to kind of disconnect again and so when i could disconnect i would run up into the hills into the prairie and where there weren't people and i'd go up in there and i that's where i really started getting to relating to that other world besides humans because I'd just been so immersed in that human world. And it was always a struggle in a lot of ways. But yeah. boy, once I got up in those hills, you know, I'm skipping school. That's where I want to go. I'm, you know, I'm trying to learn how to trap, which is always horrible. And, you know, how to hunt. I really didn't like hunting. But, yeah. you know, you, you're just experimenting with all these outdoor things that we traditionally think of as that's how you are when you're out there, <laughs> you know. And so yeah. uh, a big transformation in that way. And then from there, we moved to Germany. And I was quite unhappy. We talked about going to university in Germany and, you know, a lot of beer drinking, that kind of stuff. And, mm -hmm. and, and I just I wanted to go back to where it was where I could run around and feel comfortable and all that. So I, I went back to Iowa by myself and went back to started college there and, and went to Ames and been here ever since. And it was uh, kind of by the Des Moines River here, which has been my uh, home 
this river is my relationship to place. And so, you know, then through that evolving, uh, it was anti-war time. So I went from marching in ROTC, which is a reserve officer training where you're going to be an officer like my father and then going, I'm learning more and more about what's going on in Vietnam and going, I think I want to do this. I don't really, I didn't like military life. I've been drinking with the airmen. You know, I was old enough to kind of get into that group. And so I kind of saw a lot that I didn't really excited. And I was starting to hear stories about what was going on over there and how, the, how they were relating to their experiences. And so then that moved me off into the sandals and protesting the war. And pretty soon that was the period of the draft card where they were going to take you no matter what. Yeah. And so I burned my draft card and refused to serve. And so I was waiting to go to prison for that because I had friends that moved to Canada. And I had everything. So it was a real schizophrenic time again in my life. Where I disconnected and trying to connect. And I'd made a group of friends there through these experiences. And I give you an example. I was I started out math there because I, I really liked math. But by the time things go through in the university, I don't know what your experiences are, but it was TV lectures, eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, yes. <laughs> so by, the, by you know, my soft, into my sophomore year, I, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm changing. So then I moved to sociology because I had a thing about all these cultures and all this experience that mm, yeah. really fascinated by people, all the different ways that we relate to each other and what's important and the value systems and all that. So I was really excited by that. And so that's what I graduated in. And this group that I formed, uh, or I didn't form, but together we got, and we moved out into a farmhouse uh, outside of town. At that time, they were calling them communes, but it was just, you know, seven, eight steady people. And then there'd be people filtering through coming and going. But it was another different kind of time of learning to get along with everyone Who's going to wash the dishes, you know, <laughs> <Who's> <laughs> right. gonna take out the trash, you know, those kind of important things that we end up struggling over. Yes. And so uh, that was a great experience. And then that kind of morphed into um, couples formed. And then the, it was not the best farmhouse. It was leaky, cold. all that. So we started moving out and separately. And at that time, I'd been reading uh, Thoreau. And so Thoreau really affected me deeply because it was a long perspective and yet part of the social being. And yeah. uh, so it was it was interesting in that regard, because after I graduated uh, in the commune, we we wanted to keep our independence sort of. So I uh, we started hauling garbage. We took we started working for a garbage company. And so that way we could switch off the days we didn't want to work with whoever with uh, within our group. And so it was really an easy life. And we got mm-hmm. everything we out of the garbage you could go on for an hour of just all the things that came out of that garbage so you're getting a sociological view that is way beyond anything i learned in the university yeah. level. and so i kind of got you know appreciated that tremendously it was probably one of the most biggest experiences in a way in my life to see to look at my culture and look at the way we live and, and how we relate to all the things in our lives and mm-hmm. stuff. So uh, then that kind of changed. And like I said, then uh, Paula, the, we moved over into the uh, Des Moines River Valley, actually, right into the timber edge. And we found a cabin that didn't have running water or electricity or anything. And so, you know, we're going to go back to the land. We're going to get out of this crazy, mad world uh, yeah. war that kind of stuff and escape out into the woods. And so we did that. We got goats and chickens and we had coyotes in the yard. And it was just a, a whole different world for me. And I I was learning my plants because what can I eat? You know, <laughs> I'm running around trying to figure yeah. out how to live in a bottle of that system that I found kind of scary. And so we did that for a number of years. And I think then Paula, she uh, not only wanted to pursue a career more, I was doing, we were doing construction together to make money. And then we didn't need much money, but that's how we'd get money. And then we living off the grid as much as we could. And so she decided, I think, more to go towards a family and back in town and and pursue, because she was a very independent, very strong woman. And, you know, the construction, she one of the first women in construction and all this kind of stuff. So she ends up you know, going off in a path, she's manage, managing a uh, lumber store. And so, you know, so she pursued that and tremendous knowledge and fixing things. I mean, just incredible person. 
And so uh, that kind of left me alone. And so then I'm what I'm doing is I'm saving up my money and then I would travel. I was just still fascinated by the world, you know, out there. So I would mm -hmm. take off and I would, uh, some of my friends had moved to Canada to escape the war. And so I would go visit them. All right. And then I started going down to Mexico and then I started going deeper into Mexico and then it was Central America. And then it was like, you know, all I wanted to do is get into wilderness. After a while, it, the people didn't interest me as much as that wilderness. Mm -hmm. I would go. Like I said, my grandparents were in Florida, so I spent considerable time, month at a time, sometimes in the Everglades. At that time, it wasn't as restricted uh, as it is now and stuff. So, and then I boundary waters. Uh, I was lucky enough. One of the commune people and the friends were had grown up. His parents had taken paddling in the boundary waters, which is one of the biggest wilderness areas in the central United States. So every year we were going there and we'd go in for weeks at a time. And, you know, that was a whole nother different way of relating to the world. And so you're learning, you know, what can I eat here? Your mushrooms, things like that. And, you know, you have to, you're dependent completely on yourself, what you bring with you. And so that was uh, helped me as an individual feel better about myself and taking care of myself and things. And so that went on every year. We swore we'd never do a year that we didn't go back and do that. But then I started going other places. You know, I, I became very fascinated by Native American time, how they mm. did time. And there's archaeoastronomy was a new field at that time. And it was clocks and they were finding them all over and marking all kinds of just opened the world up. It was just like, oh, my gosh, you know, right. it isn't savage people down here you know they're really they're way ahead of us in a lot yeah, of ways yeah yeah mm. i was really caught up in that and so i traveled around looking at clocks and that got to magical places i couldn't mm. begin to describe and um so let's see then that comes back so i'm traveling i run out of money i come back i work some i do that and so pretty soon a job opened up down the road like a mile and a half at the state park and I drove a person down to his interview on my construction crew. And they said, well, why don't you interview? And at that time, I've got pretty long hair and I've got a beard, and pretty scraggy looking guy. And, and I said, oh, I'm not here to get a job. Well, you, they need the practice. So you go in there and the person they found out I had a, a degree in sociology. I'd worked some criminology and stuff like that. And so they're looking for someone to run inmate crews. So I was hired on the spot and it kind of. Wow. <laughs> I didn't expect this. And, you sure. know, I felt like upsetting my friend who I drove down here to get the job. Of and, course. <laughs> you know, this kind of stuff. So it had all these layers to it. But it was, mm -hmm. it opened up a door because it was close to me. I could put the dog in the backpack. I had a little dog and oh. drive my little motorcycle up to the park, you know, and everything. And I'd already spent quite a few years sneaking into that park, staying uh -huh. home, doing things, you know, like that. And and I, I I tried to look at it from a native person's eye and how far can I walk in one day, and that was became my home range, and so I went from going out looking for something to getting deeper to where I lived, mm. and that was the big change because then I began to really realize you know wildness is right in front of me every minute all the time, and so yeah. how do we, how do we use that to help us grow and be better human beings. So I've been really fortunate, like I say, I'm still here in the valley and uh, can't imagine going anywhere else, you know, and yeah. I don't really even too excited about traveling anymore. COVID changed things, you know, the sure. plane, all that kind of stuff too. But I, you know, I hitchhiked across the United States quite a few times across Canada. I, that was my mode of travel. You know, you're kind of dependent on what happens, you know, you've yes. opened your life up, which gets to the heart of rewilding in that, it was addressing fear. And I think that was my life was learning how to be thrown in very scary situations, very unfamiliar, all that kind of stuff. And yet still being able to find myself. And and so that's where how rewilding, that's what rewilding is to me. You know, it's like a, I'm having a conversation with the world now. <laughs> it's not just who I feel safe with. It's not all yeah. that kind of level. It's uh Opening myself up to not only internally who I am, but externally with other people, but also with the rest of the world, <laughs> which is a lot bigger than people, let me tell you. So yeah, right. I'm learning conversation. And I think, you know, this gets into I tend to think about the United States and these other countries from a, a cultural anthropological view. 
kind of tied to that. When I was in college, right coming out of college, I became a janitor for the university. And that way I could go through all the people's books and artifacts and look through everything that I probably yeah. should have <laughs> access to. But let me tell you, that's what fascinated wow. me. And so I, I really could go deep into anthropology and archaeology on my own. And now those relationships of those professors I end up meeting, you know, and getting to know years later and telling them, oh, yeah, I read, I looked in your desk, you know, I didn't, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and yet, yeah, here's what you gave me, you know, like, mm-hmm. I, and we became great friends. We wow. were inducted into Native societies mm-hmm. together and, and just had a lot of ceremonial things happen through all that. And so you don't, you know, it sounds kind of weird what you're, I'm saying, I know, but in another way, I think it was done with a good heart. And so yeah. it paid. It, it, the the yeah. thing that came back to me was good, more heart. <laughs> yes. And I don't know what more I could ask for than that. So, um, gosh, I could go into great debt. Like I say, at 76, I got a lot of stories yeah, that yeah. illustrate that stepping out of that human only perspective and, and yeah. trying to you know, realize that we're all connected. And, and I, I looked at your CMM thing and, you know, it's mm-hmm. about communications and all that. And and so, you know, I believe a lot about internal communication. You have to learn yeah. about yourself. Yes. And that's really, you know, the heart of this. Mm-hmm. And then you learn that through your experiences with other people. But actually, I think I've learned more by Realizing those people are part of something bigger, too. Yeah, yeah. And that's that wild world out there that is everywhere. I, You know, it was in Tokyo I could go on. I mean, that's why I can tell it one story. But, you know, we don't think of wildness necessarily in terms of step with other species. But let me tell you, there's a lot of other species yeah. in Japan, and they have a whole different relationship to temples and trees and rocks. And I mean, they have a whole different worldview. And so... In some ways, it was much more like native understanding. Yeah. And that's where my path led me was going through all these different groups of conservation. My career was 30 years in the Department of Natural Resources. I became the trail coordinator for the state of Iowa. So, you know, in some ways, I'm one of the most successful grant writers I've ever seen. I don't yeah. need to from them. I'm running six and seven crews across the state. We're doing restoration work, which yeah. wasn't being done. Mm-hmm. You know, it was all and manage people. And so we were resource, prairie, uh, just incredible stuff. And uh, luckily, I run into some people off the crew. I just run into a young woman the other day, and I just start crying because she was no. telling me, here she is in this field of water quality and all this. And she said, you don't know what you did for me. You have no oh. idea. And I always thought it was funny because at that time, my speeches, I was giving quite a few presentations and stuff. And a lot of you didn't get back asked back to. Uh, because I was kind of on the edge there and I'm gone about the end of the world because I, I wanted to get past all these ways of talking about how bad it all is and everything. So let's just go to the end of the world. You got cancer. Now what are you going to do? You know, mm-hmm. I mean, so now we can step out of the boxes that we've placed ourselves in and maybe mm-hmm. look at doing something a little different. And I think a lot of them got it. I don't know at all, but a lot of them did. And so, you know, I could give dimensions to that. I, DNR fired me a couple of times. One of the, somebody's person was in the college class that I was teaching. And so they weren't happy because uh-huh. they were sleeping and I woke them up and asked them to talk. <laughs> so they ran back to dad and they told uh-huh. us, hey, he's picking wow. up all this stuff. So it was kind of has all these side things that I, you know, yeah. I, I don't know if they explain things in one way, but I wasn't afraid to say what I wanted to say. Mm-hmm. And that's the only reason I could stay there. I had to be pursuing the, the very thing that I thought was important. And that's what grant writing did, because I, I never not got a grant. And it yeah. just kept bigger and bigger, because I just kept saying, you wouldn't believe how bad it is. You know, you, oh, my God, you know, and where I lived was the worst. And so I wanted to use that as the example. And I never not got a grant. And so I was looking at trails and, and made a pretty good name in trails because I wasn't looking at them as trails for people. I'm looking at them mm. as corridors for wildlife to move along yeah. and be in there and stuff. But it was more more than human perspective to those trails. And so uh, that was a different way of looking at it. And I would say things like, you know, when I was building steps and I said, they're not steps for people. They're erosion control devices that you can walk on so that you don't 
destroy what's there. Yep, <laughs> you know, yep. because it's all about what's here that's important. And that's why you're here, because you want to be in the immersed in that. You want yeah, to feel that. Yeah. And we have so much of that that happens on an unconscious level, mm-hmm. you know, with that experience. We, and, and you know, like I say, it's not urban or rural. There's not that kind of thing. It's, you know, you can see what's going on in New York City in terms of birds and Audubon groups there and identify these birds coming in and coyotes and foxes downtown. I mean, all this kind of stuff is just right. pouring around. We just not really exposed to it too much. And so I, I really like the concept of rewilding because I really like so I don't know what it means, but I know <laughs> that's where I want to go. Yeah. You know, because I I want that communication. I want that conversation with the whole world (laughs) and i'm just hungry for it so i'm excited to be able to talk about it with you yeah mark i so appreciate you sharing all of that and you know when i kind of pitched you this conversation i said you know you you bring the rewilding i'll bring the communication perspective so here's my attempt to do that and that what i hear in your story is so many different opportunities that you created to kind of make a different choice and to kind of decide for yourself what had value and what had meaning to you. And that is an idea that resonates with me because that is a part of taking a communication perspective or being what we call CMM-ish, which is, you know, just related to the CMM theory because it's a very expansive theory. And so we like to think that there's lots of room to be CMM-ish is what we call it. Um, But it's about meaning making. And that idea resonates with me so much that such a empowering idea to me to realize that the meaning that we have is made by us. We get to have choices about what what is meaningful to us. And so I think it's a helpful lens to use to say, okay, we, let's say, you know, as a country in the United States have a certain meaning around our relationship to nature, to wildlife. What kind of new meaning could we create? Having the understanding that that is a socially constructed meaning, that that's something that is not necessarily innate. We can question it and look at it and say, is that is that working for us? Is that working for the animals? Is this working for the earth? And I would say the answer is no in a lot of ways. So then yeah. that's what opens us up to the opportunity to say, well, what what do we want to be doing instead? And what what kind of new meaning can we make here? What kind of new choices can we make? What new relationships and stories can we be telling? Um, and so I see that in your story that there's a lot of finding new ways to make meaning, I think, and finding new ways to relate to things, which is very cool. And then the other CMM-ish idea I see and hear you saying is about what we would call mystery and emergence. And like you're saying, we don't, even in this conversation, this hour-long conversation, we kind of both are trusting each other and showing up and saying, we don't know where it's going to go. We're just going to trust that we're going to create something really cool here. And it sounds like in your story, you were really embodying that. Also saying, I'm going to leave room for mystery to see what's going to emerge. And that in and of itself is what allows you to have such meaningful experiences and deep relationships, like you said, not just with people and places, but with nature and experiences too. Well, good. I The little bit I've read about the CMM, I, think, I like, I mean, that's our conversations anymore breaking out into two groups or whatever, you know, they're getting pretty schizophrenic here. And so uh, I think communication is really important. And I think what mm-hmm. helps me communicate better individually with people is my conversations and relationships with more than the human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they really help me listen to and go in depth with who I'm Mm. engaged with. Even myself. I don't want to forget, you know, because I'm I keep thinking I know who I am and then things (laughs) oh okay. (laughs) Yes I I got more to go here. Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. and I yeah learn to like that. I mean I, I like not knowing what people are going to say and do and where. The, that's why this conversation is so important. I can't yeah. w- wait to see where you take me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, yes, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I know that we've both said that we're we're still learning. We're always still learning. But what is what is rewilding? How do you think of rewilding? Well, it, it, taking it to that conversing with each other and communicating, the communication goes to the world. So rewilding is about how do I learn to listen 
to the world? How do I get out of the boxes I keep placing myself in? Mm-hmm. And so rewilding is, has been a wonderful thing for me, but and you know, in a big part because I was doing this analysis of where I live, and then I, you know, I'm adding up what land use is taking place in like, for example, two thirds of 36 million acres in Iowa is two annual species that require mm-hmm. tremendous amounts of petroleum, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizer. I mean, it's just horrible what how much poison is going on you know, out there. And land use. So that's based on, as I understood more with ecology, the science of ecology is saying, you know, more diversity, the healthier the ecosystem and the healthier the ecosystem, the healthier the individuals. And that's what I I think that kind of sums it all up, because it's whether you're talking about the wide world, more than human, the ecosystem, whatever, those are just ways of talking. But, you know, otherwise we put these artificial divisions in there between us internally, us, us humans, uh, yeah, right. us, cultures, us countries, us, you know, how we define our relationships. And and so um, I think rewilding has been the most, if I have to use the word hopeful, which I hmm. avoid usually, but it's the most hopeful thing I know, because I know we can't keep going the direction we're going. Like right, for Iowa, right. for example, it's got, we, we use 98% of it. Where are you going to go there? <laughs> you know, you keep, yeah. nothing left to keep going in that direction. Yeah. And then, you know, when I moved to the worldwide perspective and I go, you know, we're in the highest extinction rate in 65 million years. You know, that's before humans. And so we have no comprehension of what that means. We have no clue whatsoever. And now the conversation has moved to climate. And I think that's interesting. But climate is by far a shallower discussion to me. That's like something down the road. Oh, we can do that. We can build green energy. We can, all that kind of approach to it is using the same mindset, Mm -hmm. the same economic perspective of the world. And so, you know, how how do we get out of that box so we can really make better decisions? And so if you don't include the rest of the world in that decision, you're not going to get very far. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's what I like about rewilding. So you mm-hmm. can take that concept, and there's people doing this all over the world now. It's been funny just because I think we're realizing how devastating our cultures have been to these places. Yes. yes. And we're surviving like Iowa. We import 85% of the food we eat here in Iowa, and we say we're mm-hmm. feeding the world, but we're doing it with two or three species. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just ironic that we look at it that way because we wouldn't survive if we didn't bring this food in from somewhere else, which is pretty yeah. much true of anywhere you live anymore. Sure. And so, you know, I have trouble dividing out the cities, the rural and urban areas. I think that's a false dichotomy, too. You know, we're all in the same world. We're in the same boat. Yeah. When you start doing those things, your choices and your opportunities to do mm-hmm. something better get very limited. And that's the yeah. same as in the conversation we're having. If I tell you what the reality is, you know, that's what I'm saying. I don't know what yeah. reality is, yeah. but I'm excited to have the conversation with you because we all right. got to be figuring out what that means. Yeah. And so that's what rewilding does for me. You know, people, a lot of people, I have a lot of native friends and they just do not like that word. They mm. want to go uh, uh, matriarchy, rematriarch the world, which is, to me, growing up was ecofeminism, which I'm very, mm-hmm. how I went, yeah, oh gosh, yeah, I, I'm, men have got a different approach to things, and it's about time we let some other view of how to do things come right, in. Right, right. And so I'm a very big feminist in that regards, but now we, they wouldn't like that word either. They would like sure. rematriarchy because that's their cultural understanding of it. Uh-huh. And so, and I think. They also, for me, the reason I go there and, and work better there is because they are saying, you know, they have a culture that says all my relations. So it isn't just humans, you know, and we have right. different ways of illustrating that to what Native people do. But it's like saying they weren't here before we got here, you know, yeah. too. Yes. And it's like, no, they've been here a long time. And they, they, <laughs> yes. they've been yes. good for thousands of years. We've only been here a couple hundred, you know, mm-hmm. so. Maybe we have something to learn here. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. in the language that they use, the concepts that they use are much more inclusive. Yeah. And that appeals, that appeals to me. 
That's so part of I, that meaning making that I'm seeing in terms of, you know, that you were kind of exposed to in a unique way by moving so much and living so many different places is that you can see how different cultures or different groups of people make meaning. And so you're kind of exposed to all these different ways of being. And then you can see yourself as, you know, being able to choose or learn from other people. And that's, again, part of uh, taking a communication perspective or, or why the theory is called CMM coordinated management of meaning is that it's coordinating our ways of being with each other. It's not us versus them. It's not, um, you know, we're better and you're worse or we're progressed further and that's better. It's, you know, how are we coordinating these ways of being together in a way that works for all of us? And obviously when we're talking about that in communication, we're talking about people coordinating two different ways of being of people, but it applies, like you're saying, to these relationships we have with nature as well, you know, coordinating these ways of being. Something that interests me is how we can see ourselves as participants in rewilding efforts or, you know, in an ecosystem, because like you're saying, a lot of people see themselves as removed. Okay. There's nature and then there's human beings, but we're just as much a part of that. So for you, what, what do you think changes when people start to see themselves as participants in that system? Well, you know, getting back to what does the word mean? um, I read something one time that talked about um, wildness is what digest your food. It's what, you know, mm-hmm. if, if, if you weren't wild, you would be dead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. And, and dead is even a form of wildness because it's decay and you're feeding other mm-hmm. things. So again, you've broken down more walls of how we define ourselves. And so, when I think of that wildness, that opened that up. But that's also true of the more than human. I'm finding out. Like, I'll give you one example. I've been out lately. We have a cougar that's down by the river somewhere. People have gotten some shot and I'm out looking for, it, you know, because yeah. I, I, I don't work off the fear. And I think that if I had to boil down everything into it, you know, culture is based on fear, this culture, mm-hmm. especially. And, and we're afraid of other people. We're mm-hmm. afraid of ourselves. We're afraid of the world out there. Yeah. And uh, I like to make the joke here in Iowa, you know, our grizzly bears are ticks because everybody's afraid to go in the woods <laughs> because they're going to get a tick bite and get sick. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it, that fear, snakes, rattlesnake, whatever, you know, that fear has dissipated so much for me. It's not that I still don't have fear, but it's it's not controlling me as much. And, and you know, that's why I'm I'm easy to step out into other cultures and other ways mm-hmm. of talking about the world and spirituality. I could talk, you know, forever about that in a different way. And and so I've kind of lost this fear of that. And and yeah. that is rewilding <laughs> to me. Yeah. That, that is the heart of rewilding mm-hmm. is how do we have a relationship with who we're with, where we're at with mm-hmm. ourselves with everything around us, you know, our food, everything. I mean, so that's been the best. If I could offer that up to anybody, that would be what I would offer. Because yeah. getting rid of fear is like, man, the world is magical. I mean, it's mm-hmm. just fun. Yeah. <laughs> but there's so much to it that comes out of not being afraid of people. Yeah. Well, I think you're hearing your story and your perspective is really important and cool for me because when I kind of look at my generation, especially, I think that, you know, doing some of the things that you living off the grid, you know, is kind of uh, trendy, sounds kind mm-hmm. of cool. People, people like how that sounds, right? but a lot less people actually do it and make it happen for themselves. And so I think that's kind of my question is there of how do we get from idea to action or from, you know, our imagination to embodying these things that we say we value? How can we actually live it out? You know, because I can I can learn about rewilding. So I feel like I'm in this kind of first phase. I'm Mm -hmm. learning about rewilding and gaining an awareness of that. I'm trying to understand more about, you know, the 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 native species in the area that I'm in and what does biodiversity look like and kind of learning all of these new things. And that's awesome. And then that begs a new question of okay, where do we go from here? How do you take actual action around it? And so that's what I think your story is kind of helping to share or helping to answer that question for me of, yeah, what does it look like to take real action around that? 
let me give you one example. I'll use the example that you brought up about, you know, it's kind of trendy to live off the mm-hmm. grid. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because we, we're realizing we have, we have to do things differently. Yeah. And, and I think we're looking for connection because our connections are dissipating and becoming yeah. struggling. And so we're, we're searching for that kind of thing. And so one way to put that in perspective is, you know, this is the wildest time ever in human history ever nothing we have no idea we've never been here no one's ever been here Mm -hmm. so you can't just go back we're going to have to figure out you know how do you go forward well you don't go forward you figure out where you're at where you want to live and and that's what going you know off the grid means i think to people yeah you know you form these bonds with people and stuff and so uh just keep that in perspective that you know it's the wildest time ever now. We we are so never been here. We, you know, yeah. we have no idea where to go. And we're knowing we can't continue doing a lot of things we're doing. Mm-hmm. We know that and I, we could analyze our culture, you know, a lot of different ways through economic perspective, you know. And I think the biggest part, let me tie this together, ecology. Mm-hmm. Ecology you know, is, is really important to me because it's saying, you know, how what are the value systems that we use to relate to ourselves, mm-hmm. to others, and to the more than human world? And you break it down usually into, well, most people think of instrumentally. How does how does this going to help me? How am I going to feed my all this kind of and then yeah. how am I going to get along with someone over here and and how am I going to not be terrified out here in the woods. You know, how am I going to be living out this way? And and all that, you know, is a fear-based perspective to me. Mm-hmm. And then, so you get back to, uh, I think, animal rights. You can talk about a lot of your voice, but when you start giving value, intrinsic value, everything has value in and of itself, irregardless of you, mm-hmm. because it's like, you got to have something to digest your food, and it isn't you. You know, it's wildness. It's something else. And so now we're big yeah. on probiotics, and we're all talking about vitamins. You know, yeah, yeah. You know, the latest thing I've been reading about food, we went through all the thing about eating meat, you know, people in the past living off meat and how important diet, vegetable, all that stuff. And what they found out was it's the more diversity in your food is mm-hmm. what makes longer life. Mm-hmm. And that's of everything. That's eco. That's that's it. That's the heart of it all. The more diversity, the healthier we're all going to be. And so I yeah. try to keep that in mind as I don't know the answers. So how do I give intrinsic value to otherness as I have to learn from them? Because mm-hmm. that's what I am. I am them. <laughs> you know, yeah, I am the yes. I am the, I am these things. I am urban. I am rural. I am, mm. Anyway. Yeah. I'm very privileged. And that's one of the hardest ones I struggle with because then we step back into the social human definitions of how we're going to function. And now we've got, you know, Palestine and Israel and all yeah. these things going on. And I don't know, you know, those are the things that weigh, those are fear-based things. Yes, yeah. I, I need to have a place that isn't fear-based because mm-hmm. the real world is not fear-based. It's just wild. <laughs> yeah. I like that. You know, what you're kind of saying or what I'm hearing you say is that, yeah, wildness is, everything and what you just you know i am everything i am nature i am all of these things and so i'm curious about what it means or what it can do for people to understand how is wildness how is rewilding how is conservation and nature and you how is it related to everything well one good dimension to that and i think this especially is important for you i think with young people i immediately um I think that's what the 60s and that representation of that old culture of war and controlling and then anti-war. And then you start looking, you know, that's when things really broke open. You know, feminism, environmentalism, all these things we started questioning and looking at and trying to refigure. And I think that's really critical thinking is extremely important. And so how do we bring that forward into a uh, thing. And I I, were, I wrote grants for AmeriCorps. I don't know if you're a Peace Corps in the United States, AmeriCorps, and it's mostly younger people. And I ran hundreds of people through that program. And I would always give them the end of the world speech to begin with, which threw them for a loop. But like I say, uh, I think the more they got to understand me and the work that we were doing, they better understood what that meant. Because, you know, we, we need to work with 
everything <laughs> that's out there. And we've pretty well, you know, manipulated and converted a lot of it into monoculture kind of thinking. And right. we need to step out of that. And so I, I felt so fortunate to be around young people. I still, like I said, the greatest reward I have is still running into these people that come up to me and go, I don't know if you remember me, but <laughs> you yeah. know, you believe what you did. And it's just that just melts me because it, mm. it meant that they were hearing something at that age that I would have appreciated hearing more at that age. And so I think young people, you know, we look, you know, you're the ones that are facing a lot of this that us old people are going, oh, I got going to get me, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, in another way, that's a false way to look at it. But I think young people symbolize a whole big thing to me. And being 76 years old, I'm still a young person in some ways <laughs> because I'm still not going to let yeah. fear control my life and my decisions, you know. I think that's the only thing I really have to ever offer right. anybody, especially young people. Is you know, you don't know where life's going. You know, don't don't be afraid. Do follow your heart. You know, you'll you'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> What's really compelling to me is this truth at the center of all this that. It's about the relationships and, you know, in, in different things that I've read from you or listening to other podcasts you've been on, kind of this idea of like, how do we save ourselves through we rewilding and thinking about that um, dichotomy between hope and fear? It's, it's like, we've always been asking ourselves the question of how do we save ourselves? And when we yeah. answer that question coming from a place of fear, it looks like isolating ourselves. It looks like disconnecting from nature. It looks like, you know, hoarding, hoarding the resources and not sharing and not seeing yourself as part of a relationship or a system and really going into this kind of like self-preservation mode. I think if we answer the question of how do we save ourselves from a place of hope, that's when it looks like rewilding and relationships and we save ourselves through saving the planet and saving the diversity that we have. And so it's, yeah, understanding ourselves as connected in that kind of way that our own liberation, our own well-being happens with the well-being of the planet as well. Yeah. Well said, well said. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think COVID really, you know, taught us a lot. That was a good thing, you know, because we isolated and yet in another yes. way we went deeper. And, you know, yes, we started looking. Got to have a pet. I got to have some other being I can relate to. I got to mm -hmm. look out the window. I got to see some birds. That you know, so there was. So it's never a, a binary one or the other thing. I've learned mm -hmm. that it's it's a flow of life. It's just the flow. And yeah, you know, at times it gets stuck and at times it rushes and all that. But you know, it's life. And I think that's one of the things of old age is when you reflect back on your life and you look at the flow, you go. Wow, <laughs> you know, yeah. I could have never figured out this was where things were gone. Mm -hmm. It's a very exciting time. It's it's an exciting time. Now, I yes. think it reminds me back of the '60s because we're we've come to a point where things are pretty scary. And yeah. either where what world do you want to live in? Mm -hmm. You want to be scared? Or you want to be healing? Yeah, you're healing everything else out there. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I, one thing that's sticking with me from the story you shared, you know, at the very beginning of our conversation is that you were able to travel and see so many beautiful things. And then it kind of something, you know, changed. And I don't know exactly what you would call that within yourself, but when you kind of found a home in Iowa and decided, oh, well, look how much is right here for me to see. You said, you know, you're not as interested in travel anymore. And that's interesting to me because I also created the opportunity for myself to travel in Europe for six months after I graduated and it was amazing and I loved it. And I'm, ex I'm excited to do more travel, uh -huh. but there was also a part of me that when I came home saying, you know, Oh, when can I go back? I just want to, you know, keep seeing amazing things, but obviously that's very uh, expensive to do to travel <laughs> around the world. And so I kind of came to this conclusion of, well, let me remind myself that there's beauty and amazing things right here at home in my home of Indiana or in the United States, you know, it's just, when we see ourselves as so disconnected from nature, it can feel like, okay, I gotta, I gotta, you know, fly to a different country and go 
find a big mountain to hike in when it's like you, you obviously know, you know, there's so many wonderful state parks in every state in the United States and there's opportunities to connect with nature. And like, we have a state park like 20 minutes away from me. And I grew up in this area and I never <laughs> knew it was there until yeah. this year. And I went and I thought, this is incredible. And it's one of my favorite places to be now because you can be so connected to nature and be a part of it yourself. But yeah, I just think that's such a big part of it, of kind of looking in your own backyard and seeing what, what's the nature there and what's, what's the role you can have there. Yeah, we could talk in quite depth of that because uh, I, as young people, that's what I saw, people on the cruise, they couldn't wait to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And it was like the same one I was saying about the draft store. I had friends that go, well, I'm not going to serve, so I'm moving to Canada. And they moved to the wildest places in mm. Canada. I, I'm still a friend. I go every other year, Vancouver Island. And, and oh, my gosh, you know, a little fishing village, old growth forest. All, and yet he's always upset because there's some development coming in. There's some thing that's just like makes him cry. You yeah. know, and I always used to tease him. I said, well, you know, that's because you ran away. You should have stayed here on the front mm. line. In <laughs> Iowa, the most biologically altered state in North America. Mm -hmm is where else would you want to be, you know? And and that's what I'm learning about the wildness. You know, the wildness is not just externally in a state park with artificial lines and a, a little area we've allowed to heal a little bit. Because right, that's right. why I started that career. Yes. It's realizing that, you know, the wildness is in your stomach. It's your mind that's mm -hmm. not wild. <laughs> and that's what traveling exposes to. Mm. And you get self-confidence and you go, oh, wow, I've learned so much. And, you know, I'm finding out who I am and I'm seeing all this different stuff. But that's always true. Sitting here in the chair where I am right now, I'm yes. doing I'm yes. going through that process right in my mind. You're doing that right now, too. Yeah. I, I hope. I hope mm -hmm. I can help. That. Absolutely. And just a funny little thing you made me think of talking about the arbitrary lines of the state park is that there's a section on the highway here in Indiana and in the kind of median, it's, you know, plants. And there's a sign that says, you know, native species. <laughs> and at first I see, I'm like, oh, that's so cool. And then I'm like, this is a block in the middle of the highway. Like, what good is this doing any of us? Um, but maybe it's the first step, you know, into a, a very, very beginning of rewilding the middle of the highway, um, obviously, is kind of missing the point a little bit. But it is interesting and cool to see the the different native species. And you have to start somewhere, I guess. Uh, well, your mind, your mind did. That's what you're laughing at the sign. At the yes, day. right. Your mind went wild. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. But yeah, you mentioned that Iowa is the most, what is it? Uh, biologically altered. altered. Okay, yes. Biologically altered. So I'm wondering, can you can you tell us a little more about Iowa's biodiversity? Well, that's what, you know, when I moved here and, and, and I started trying to analyze, I was very fortunate because I, I moved over by the river. So mm -hmm. Everything else is corn and beans. I mean, you know, nothing is left but those river corridors. Yeah. And now the water is so polluted. I mean, it, I could mm -hmm. go on forever about how horrible it is. And I think it's important to do that. That's the end of the world speech. Because you're yeah. going, you can't keep doing this. You can't eat the fish out of the river. You can't swim in the river. You yeah. can't go kayaking. You can't let your dog in the river. Wow. You see what I mean? It, so it's it's become, and then the airs, you know, all these poisons are spraying. And every, every year... On and on. It's like the fires. I don't know if you had smoke um, coming with your yes, fires. But yes. It's just, you can see it. You can feel it. And then with age, you realize that, well, wait, where's all those birds? Where'd they go? What? There's mm -hmm. no bugs on my windshield. There's no, you know, the, there's less and less diversity everywhere I look. And so I can go really depressed and I can go scream and yell and protest and all. And I've done, I do all that. And I don't, I think it's a good yeah. thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I have to understand my place in the bigger thing because, you know, nature is a human construct and we, we can analyze it and talk about it, biodiversity yeah. and all terms. Yeah. But while this, is way beyond anything we can think about. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's not a thing. It's not an object. It's not a place. You know, it's how the world works. Yeah. And it's kind of letting go of that control of trying to control everything and put a sign on it and say, here's some native diversity, you see. And, yeah. and so, you know, it's stepping out of that artificial human 
yeah. clamp down on something so that we think we can decide what's better. And it's part of us, you know, we still have to do that. I don't, I don't mean you don't do some of that, but I just mean that isn't all of it. Some of it, you have to have some faith in that. The world takes care of itself with or without you, you know, and so, yes. you know, that's a freedom that we need to cultivate within ourselves because mm-hmm. it's not about control. The more we try to control, the more problems we cross ourselves, I think. Yeah. So how do, how do we facilitate that wildness? And you can feel it when you go to the state park and you can laugh about it when you see it in the, in the <laughs> middle of the road. Yes. So, I mean, that that's. That's really it. Mind is starting to uh, become wild. And and the wilder it is, I think the healthier you'll feel and the healthier you'll understand what direction to go in with your life, you know, what to do. And so mine led to, OK, how can I restore what was here? And then I realized I'll never restore what was here. So how can I make where I want to live here now? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's what my life has become. And well, I couldn't ask for anything more than that. I mean, I, I, I'm such fortunate, privileged, lucky white guy. I can't tell you. <laughs> yeah. It's a, a burden to carry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I know on your um, on the Be Wild, Rewild website, I've seen this language of, you know, trust wildness and that that seemed to be a real kind of founding idea for the creation of that project. So that seems when I first read that on your website, I had one understanding of what that meant. And now talking to you, it has another level that is trust a wildness within yourself. But I wonder if you could share a little bit more about that. What what does it mean or what does it look like to trust wildness, to really trust wildness in yourself and in the world? Well, I think I've been trying to give examples of that, of where I realized that, OK, I'm going to get fired. OK, oh, OK, you know, I, I mean, there's things more important than that. And I think young people look at jobs now like that. They're moving constantly. They, they have a lot more openness about moving around and jumping the forest. Oh, God, I got to stay here. I'm going to lose my whatever, you know, and all that. And so, yeah. again, security, the fear of something. Yes. And so, you know, once I learned to trust the wildness of my life, it's always been quite bountiful. <laughs> it's always been more than I ever could have imagined. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm the luckiest guy in the world, living in the wildest place in the world. And I think learning to live that way is very important, especially the way things are now, especially because it's yeah. so fear dominated mm-hmm. and you know, education wise. And, you know, I, I remember we <laughs> put a sign on a tree explaining the tree and they dripped the bark all off the tree and the tree died. So it's like, okay, maybe signage in the park isn't the best way to go. Maybe it's just letting them run wild out there, get dirty, roll in the mud, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So that started me down that path. You know, if we don't have to have an answer. We have to be open to the question. And and that's yeah. why we say you go to a park. It's not even on a conscious level. You just know, well, the air's better. <laughs> you know, the, my yeah. attention different. You know, I'm not looking at a screen. I'm not bent my head down physically. You're moving. There's all these different dimensions to it that we don't consciously give uh, credit to, mm-hmm. but we know on some level. And so how do we learn to talk to ourselves? How do we learn to listen to ourselves telling us, wait, this this feels pretty good. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's so temporary. It isn't just for a quick movie, it isn't a quick ice cream cone. It's, you know, wait, this this went deeper than that. This, this you know, this made me want to be with other people that like this stuff. And mm-hmm. so we get together and we can now go out and go camping and we can go paddling and we can, you know, share those deeper things. And, you know, all that happens really on a not conscious level. I mean, or we don't acknowledge it that way. Even. Yeah, that's a that's a big thing to learn, I think, just. Trusting that wildness is, it's almost, I guess you could say it's a religion for me, <laughs> but yeah. it's a spiritual quest, I, I think, mm-hmm. that I still work. And, and, you know, as you get older, you start thinking about death and you start thinking about your friends are dying and your family and, you know, your pets and all of those different ways. And, and yet I feel, man, I've been so lucky up to this point. You know, what the heck? <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. can't wait to see where this goes, <laughs> you know, so... Uh, that's another way I think, I, as I'm personally looking at people yeah. dying. Yeah. So. yeah. And the world dying around me. 
I mean, that's yes, another good point. I have to get out of that. This is, you know, the world's changing. That's for sure. And it will take care of itself, but that doesn't let me off the hook. I still have to do what my heart's telling me to help it heal or to help it yeah. go on a while. And that's, that's what I work at. That's the only thing I can, you know, I retired quite a while ago and I keep getting drugged back in by people like you. That bring <laughs> yes. me back. And so I, I'm fortunate. I feel so fortunate that that's still of an interest and people do that, yeah. but I, more and more, I'm kind of, you know, I'm not out to push anything. Yeah. Well, I like how you describe it as almost like a practice or a way of being in the world. And again, that's why I want to talk about taking a communication perspective or having a communication practice is there a mindfulness practice, all these things I see that go hand in hand is that communication is not just something we do. And maybe you would say, you know, rewilding is not just something we do. It's not an act. It's not, it's not just, you know, planting a native species. That's right. In fact, it's biggest so much is- more. The rewilding is people that want to go back and make it something. Yeah. And it's like, good luck. <laughs> you know, yes. Invasive species yes. are taking over the world. Relax. Don't you think you're an invasive species? Yes. You know, I mean, how do we divide the world out like that? We do these false binaries and then we end up afraid, you know, or yeah. control. Yeah. You know, and not that you don't do those things. Not that you don't. I'm, I've spent my career working on facilitating native species, maintaining and wildness. Yes. That. So it's not that. It's not a false choice here. It's just a way of looking at it. Yeah. And it's when I hear you talk about trusting wildness, it sounds like another way to say what I talked about at the beginning of this conversation is leaving room for mystery. And again, that's just the way that you are showing up to the world is with that in mind and with that as part of your perspective. And yeah, again, that in and of itself creates opportunities for so much to happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And so it matters, but I think it, you know, it's kind of a invisible thing to people or it feels really abstract. And I think that's what, you know, it's hard for people to grasp is that unless they're maybe like you really, really in it, then it's hard to take that step into it. Do you see that happening? Is that? Well, I'll I'll give you one way of looking at it. It's children. Mm -hmm. Look, Look at a child. A child is wild. A child is you know, captivates you. You you yeah. know, I'm just you're drawn to children because they're expressing that trusting of wildness. It, they're learning in the world, they're at your mercy, or however you want to say it, you know, and you want to protect them and take care of them, but another way, they're just gonna keep going, you know. And and so that wildness in there, you, you learn to trust that child. And I think we're fascinated by children. I think that's why people want to have children, mm-hmm. is because it lets you step out of yourself and look back at that part that wasn't afraid and so exciting and we do that with pets too we, we do it with lots of other beings but that wildness thing is it's a hard thing to express i guess that's why i, I don't even know still how to talk about it in some yeah, way right but i know how it makes me feel mm-hmm. and i'm learning more and more to look at my feelings and i think again back to young people you know you're looking for your wildness you, you you've grown up enough to now you're getting encased in this culture, in this world. Now I want to go to Europe. I want to go yes, see the world. Yes. I want to get out of this box I'm in. Yeah. And you should. But I think, again, you can get out of the box anywhere you are. And that mm-hmm. and that and that's the heart of it. I mean, that's what we learn in our travels, and they're important. And I wouldn't say don't do it. But another way, I've gotten to the point where I just couldn't get to wilderness enough and be there long enough. I just couldn't do it. And then I realized... Well, that isn't exact. I mean, now I know what's there. I get the feel. I get it. I yeah. know now. So I'm going to grab that and take it with me wherever I go. Yeah. And that's the gift of it all, I think. Mm-hmm. It's, it doesn't get any wilder than this right now, ever. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And we don't know what that means. But yeah. 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 It'd be we scary. It, and it is scary in some ways. In another way, you know, it's life. It just goes on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things, some of the language we use in CMM is to talk about um, creating better social worlds, which kind of feels like where we're ending in this conversation is that if we've talked about the stories we have been telling or what we have been making, and then kind of deciding, is that what we want to keep making? Or is those the stories we want to keep telling? Or would we like to tell some new stories? That's kind of this question that gets us to look toward the future. And like you said, this is the beginning of a conversation. This is not 
the end all be all. This is a, you know, an invitation in, and then hopefully can generate just more conversations and more in people bracing, embracing wildness within themselves and their lives and um, finding ways to practice rewilding, you know, or however you would say that. And so I, I definitely see, you know, everything you've talked about today, rewilding and uh, trusting wildness as part of creating better social worlds for ourselves. And again, it's about us being participants in our social world. So we actually do have that power. You're saying, you know, okay, look at where we are. We can't keep going on how we have been. So how do we create a better social world? Not only for ourselves, but for the planet, for nature, for things that are beyond human too. Yeah. And I, I can give you a perfect example of that when I had to think about what we were going to say here and everything. And I thought the biggest thing I really do that separates me from most people and most things is I say, you know, I'm here to represent the frog. And so I had my little frog pin on uh-huh. today. Because I wanted to be sure and say, you know, if we don't include the rest of the world at this table, at this conversation, it's not a very good conversation. Yeah. It's a very shallow conversation. And so I want to know how to always bring that otherness into the room, into the conversation. And I think that's really difficult for us. Our language is not set up that way. Our culture is not set up that way. Our way of thinking is not set up. But to me, that's the heart of a human being. (laughs) It's the human being includes the rest of the world because you're not alone. You know, you're not, it's not just about you. (laughs) So uh, that's really important. And that's the thing, most important thing. I And I know I throw most people there off because I have stood up in many of me. I just went to the biggest environmental meeting in the state of Iowa. And I'm, they asked for my opinion. And I said, well, it's great, but I don't see one frog in the room here. And I meant that, you know, as an allegory or something in that we've talked all about the human legislatures and laws and parks yes. and talked about all that stuff, but we never talked about the other species being represented. And so a big change that hit my life was uh, I was, we had the uh, International Environmental Ethics Conference in Iowa before anybody knew what that even meant. Yes. So we went and had that and we had Council of All Beings and it was a three-day uh, prep thing to where we had to, we made masks and we tried to learn about one species. And we realized mm-hmm. that we all have a species. I don't, you know, so we all have some bird. We all have something in our life that we've connected to. And a frog was a big one for me because it's a person in two worlds. It's, it's a being living in two worlds. And I, native people gave me a language, uh, um, two hawks watching. And it was because they said, you're so good at having two views of things. You know, mm-hmm. it's like you're using both eyes. Or, yeah, they had all this. And it was so, oh, it just made me cry. So yeah. touching because, and I had, then I could acknowledge that, you know, we need we need that otherness to recognize and part of us to be figure out who we are. Mm-hmm. And if we don't have them in us, when we're doing that, we've limited ourselves and our understanding of ourselves and our relationship to where we are. So, you know, that's the biggest thing. And that Council of All Beings was just changed my life. I mean, yeah, it changed. Wow. It was like we formed bonds that I've never formed with other people because they weren't being just people. <laughs> you know, they yes. had their own other thing they wanted to speak for. And that was really powerful stuff. Yeah. Well, Mark, I so appreciate your time and your perspective today. Is there anything else you want to share as we kind of wrap up our conversation? Just thank you for pursuing this conversation about communication because we tend to limit what that word means. We yeah. don't understand really. Communication happens non-verbally. It happens all these different ways. And and we need to understand how to communicate. It, it seems to be deteriorating as far as I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you. Because what you you've really helped me rethink about a lot of things a lot differently now too and how to better communicate so really you've been the help for me today you know so thank you for that i really that's helped i haven't had to sit down like this for a while and do this so. yeah oh well thank you thanks for saying that and yeah i feel excited and it it makes sense to me that you know okay the name of the podcast is stories lived stories told and if i could just take a second to explain where that comes from is that there's a model within the theory of CMM called the LUT model, L-U-U-U-U-T-T. And that's 
L for lived stories. And then the T at the end is told stories. So that's where the name of the podcast comes from. But then it's saying in between that are all these other kinds of stories. And the U's represent things like untold stories, unheard stories, untellable stories. So it's like, yes, there are stories we tell and and they do differ from the stories we live because we're attaching meaning to them. But then what happens when we start looking at all those other stories that aren't getting told? And so I, I, I kind of see rewilding through that lens of what are what are the untold stories that we're not hearing and what what are the untold stories that that we could start telling and what changes when we start telling those stories and so to me it just is all about stories and I appreciate you know the stories you've been able to share today and I'm hopeful and the way I see it is that this conversation is part of telling a new story around our relationship to wildness Good. I, I, I'm so happy to share what it's done for me. I, like, I have a hard time expressing it, but I'm the luckiest guy in the world. You know. So <laughs> yeah. Thank you for adding to that. Okay, that is all for our conversation with Mark. One thing I'll go ahead and point out is that if you'd like to be a part of this conversation with Mark, There's a Facebook group that he runs that you can join, which I will include a link to in the show notes. At the end of each episode, I like to offer some questions to reflect on. This acts as a next turn, so the conversation doesn't stop when the episode does. Today, the questions I would have you think about based on this conversation are, how can you embrace wildness in yourself? And what opportunities do you have to experience nature, beauty, and wilderness in your own backyard? You are welcome to reach out to me to share your reflections to these questions, as well as any questions of your own or ideas that you have. You can do that through email, the website, or by commenting on Instagram and YouTube. The reason I invite you to share your reflections with me is to stay in dialogue. Other great ways to keep dialogue going is to follow the show wherever you listen, leave a rating and review, and most importantly, share episodes that mean something to you with others especially because I am doing series this year and really concentrating on using a communication perspective on a wide, diverse array of topics. I think that widens the opportunity to invite people in. I am supported by the CMM Institute for Personal and Social Evolution. This podcast is just one of many initiatives designed to create space for more conversations that move us toward those better social worlds we hope to create. I'll go ahead and mention specifically one of the other initiatives of the CMM Institute, and that is the line of Cosmo Activities. Uh, It's an educational series of mainly social emotional learning resources, and they're all available at our new website, which is www.cosmoactivities.com. There's really great resources for kids of all ages, and we're currently working on developing a Cosmo Parents activity, which if you'd like to be a part of that, you're welcome to fill out our survey, which can be found in the show notes and also at the website www.cosmoactivities.com. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being curious, and thank you for being a part of this story. I'm Abby, and this has been Stories Lived, Stories Told. Thank you.